the Joyful Noise Radio Hour. Hello and welcome to the Joyful Noise Radio Hour. My name is Carl Hofstetter. During this episode, we will be focusing on one solitary compilation, which we began assembling last year at the top of quarantine. And now that we are officially one year into this COVID pandemic, we thought it would be apropos to revisit this album of amazing tracks that our artists recorded during this extremely weird time. It is called Safe in Sound, Home Recordings from Quarantine. The idea was um, when the pandemic hit last March, basically all of our bands were immediately sidelined from touring. And as you may or may not know, um, for bands of the size that are on our label, um, this is essentially the equivalent of uh, being laid off from your job with absolutely no notice. Bands make most of their money from touring, and so this was a huge financial blow to the majority of our roster. So our idea to try to combat this was to ask bands from our roster to write and record new songs from quarantine in their homes, which we would then assemble into this compilation in which 100% of the money would go towards those bands to help offset their lost revenue from this year. The compilation turned out uh, far better than I ever expected it to, to be frank. Ended up becoming a 20 song double LP, which contains some of the best music that I've heard from a lot of these artists. It's uh, truly incredible what they were able to to create in these circumstances. And so I wanted to just highlight a few of my favorite tracks from Safe and Sound. And I'll be starting with the opening track, which comes from Rob Crow and his family. I will also be speaking with Rob Crow later in this episode. So stick around for that. But right now, let's listen to Rob Crow and his five children, all covering the shags. Oh, the rich people want what the poor people's got. And the poor people want what the rich people's got. And the skinny people want what the fat people's got. And the fat people want what the skinny people's got. You can never please and ever believe. The sharp people want what the tall people's girls got And the tall people want what the short people's girls got And the little kids want what the big kids got And the big kids want what the little kids got You can never please and never believe in this world Oh, the girls with short hair want long hair The girls with long hair want short hair Up next, we have a new track from Deerhoof. Deerhoof, hands down, win the gold medal for being the most productive band during this pandemic. 
We were in the process of releasing their album, Future Teenage Cave Artists, when this pandemic hit, which obviously halted all touring and whatnot. Interesting side story about that, the cover art for that album features drawings of viruses and lyrical themes touch on concepts like uh, the end of the world as we know it. Definitely seems like the Earth has a knack for uh, prophecy in their music. But after the release of Future Teenage Cave Artists, Deerhoof did not sit idle. Joyful Noise and Deerhoof collaborated throughout the year, releasing three other albums. The first of which is a Bandcamp only digital release called Surprise Symphonies. Then came a new live album with jazz legend Wadada Leo Smith. And finally, their highly conceptual album of quote unquote covers known as Love Lore. This is a covers album in a way that only Deerhoof could make a covers album, you know, where it uh, includes over 100 artists and uh, jumps from the Knight Rider theme song to uh, Ornette Coleman seamlessly. Anyway, in the midst of all of that, they also wrote and recorded this new song for the Safe and Sound compilation, which is titled Dismantle the System. We have a new track from the Chicago band Ohm. Ohm was one of our bands that was hit hardest by the pandemic. Um, just prior to the shit hitting the fan, we released their album Fantasize Your Ghost, which is incredible and you should absolutely buy it. 
but the timing of which was um, just a real travesty in that Ohm is one of the best live bands I've probably ever seen. And um, them being unable to tour behind this album was just, um, just a real shame. So if you ever get the chance to see the band live, hopefully soon, fingers crossed, get fucking vaccinated, you absolutely should see this band. But right now, here's a new track recorded by the band In Quarantine. The song is titled Homicidal Hamsters. And the final song I'd like to feature from this Safe and Sound compilation is one of the coolest collaborations that came out of this. 
Um, this is a collaborative track from Kishibashi and L1011. Um, these two bands are two of my absolute favorite bands in the world, and um, they weren't really aware of each other prior to becoming label mates in 2019. And even though their music is uh, very different from one another, to me it seems like there's this very interesting common thread. So I really pushed hard for these guys to do a song together. Um, glad I did because the end result is pretty amazing, I think. Hope you enjoy it. The song is called Every Day is a Sunday. Jesus, that song is so good. You just heard Kishibashi and L1011 collaborate for the first time ever, courtesy of Quarantine. That song and every other song on the episode tonight appears on our benefit LP, Safe and Sound, home recordings from Quarantine. There are a bunch of other amazing bands on this comp also that I wasn't able to play tonight. Those bands include Swamp Dog, Helvetia, CJ Boyd with Will Oldham, The Ophelias, Kramer, Thor Harris, 
Mike Adams at His Honest Weight, No Joy, Chad Fair at Hi-Fi Club, Tall Tall Trees, Soons, Good Fuck, Dumb Numbers, Sound of Series, and Magic Sword. So, if you are so inclined, pick up a copy of this double LP. 100% of the money goes to these bands in this very fucked up time of no touring. Next up, I will be speaking with the infamous Rob Crow. You might know Rob from his many, many bands, but in fact you might actually know his bands and not realize it's the same guy, because many of his bands sound absolutely nothing like one another. Um, Everything from Pinback to Anal Trump. I don't really know of any other musician that has the artistic range and just pure tenacity of this guy. So it's uh, a real honor to speak with him and hope you enjoy our conversation. Here we go. Three, two, one, clap. Hi, Carl. Hi, Rob. How you doing? (laughs) I'm doing all right. I do like an hour and a half of exercise every day on the elliptical yeah and whatnot and you called during the first chunk of that so it was early enough so i could stop and make up for it later i i, I think then i'm well, sorry to disrupt your routine oh no no problem uh, and thanks for jumping on but yeah man uh yeah you've uh so uh, for for people that might not know like um you had a pretty dramatic transformation um a few years ago when you um quit drinking and started like jogging i don't know how or doing elliptical i don't know how much per day but like um didn't you lose something like 100 pounds yeah and i kind of just did it again because i started gaining weight even though i was I thought I was, I mean, comparatively, I was taking, still taking care of myself. Yeah. Not drinking or anything, but, you know, trying to stay away from just bread, just stuff. And being, you know, with the twins, I was, I was in the best shape when we had the twins. <laughs> and then, like, I was, I dropped the kids off at school, then go for jog on the beach, and then, mm-hmm. then go to the, to the gym then pick up the kids for what this and that, you know? And, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but then it was like, well, I can't really go anywhere now. So it was like, order in the food. Right. Don't have time to make anything. Don't, yeah. You know, I think that. a lot of people are having that, like, well, you now, know, the COVID, uh, <laughs> COVID pounds. I can't but, blame anybody for that. Yeah. Can't COVID totally. on that. <laughs> COVID shame. uh but yeah yeah so like it's um it's like sort of a a interesting part of your history as a musician i think is is the fact that you you sort of publicly quit music and and then quit drinking and then got super healthy and then realized that you wanted to do music like way more prolifically than you had before, <laughs> you know? Just so you know, this is my least favorite thing to talk about. Oh, sorry. But I will go through. I didn't, I didn't meet, I, I didn't try to bring it up. I didn't like have it written down or anything, but it's like, it just feels like, like this is a compelling story, man. Like people should like, I think there are a lot of musicians that struggle with alcoholism, obviously. You know, and um, just it's 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 unusual to see that dramatic of a transformation in somebody so quickly. You know, and that that's hopeful. I think. Thank you. Um, I mean, I I wasn't like I was a I drank more than almost anybody alive, but I wasn't bad like a bad person because of it so much right. but the idea that i could easily become a bad person because of it shocked me into saying fuck this all this i just need to not do that like what am i why am i doing anything i everything i seem to enjoy seems to be destructive including making stuff you know mm-hmm. <clears throat> so yeah so 
Yeah. And and the only reason I even announced it wasn't to, I swear to you, it was not to be dramatic. It's the last thing. I'm one of those guys that has a problem, you know, admitting when he has needs something, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm just trying to be realistic and trying to, yeah. you know, you only, that's the thing about pers- perspective is you only have your own and just try to, you know, it's hard to gauge what the you know making sure you're not being a horrible person sometimes yeah and if that leans too far if for me if that leans too far into me not getting what i want out of life then i'll take that rather than the horror of realizing that i've shorted somebody out of there right yeah but i swear to you that the 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 thing on the facebook yeah the thing on no, the, I, was I, like that was all immediate that was i swear not to be dramatic but just to explain like totally. okay i'm not going to be on here anymore and this is why and uh, you know so just like eh, that's that's done so you don't we don't need to talk about it and i didn't talk about it on social media I, like right. i did not post anything or look at anything anywhere until you know much later when i was like healthy again and, and like said i guess i should try you're like oh shit pitchfork wrote a news story about this i don't i don't even know if they did and if they did i think they I, did i'm pretty sure know. they did i don't know what like what would the, to me it'd be like what's the, the story was on? you know rob crow quits music yeah uh, but it's more like <laughs> guy we don't care quits doing thing nobody <laughs> <laughs> well they, they don't care until you quit you know uh, I'm afraid of stuff like this because this goes along with a whole psychology of people trying to be demonstrative about stopping things like that, but only because they want to keep being this this thing. I swear to you, that was not what I was doing. Oh, totally. I'm not one of those like, and then they'll be sorry type of people. Uh, <laughs> I got no, yeah, I'd rather just totally. like, do the thing. Let's have fun. Let's We, we could all be doing things together there's plenty of you know you know art to go around that we can all not do our own thing and not have to be constantly ripping off every other person yeah well you seem to have plenty of that art to go around um so i mean so we've done the 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 artist in residence thing you know that you did i think uh two years ago two is it three years now oh. um but, you know, we, we do this, you know, almost every year where we ask a, an artist to, we basically give you like a, you know, blank check to <laughs> create whatever the fuck you want throughout the year. And a lot of artists, you know, will, will make like four records throughout the year. Um, you made 12 and they were all from different bands. And that was in, just insane. And you did that the same time that you just had newborn twins, yeah. right? Which were your yeah. fourth and fifth kids. Like it's, uh, I can't, I, I still can't believe you did that. Like just being a new parent myself, knowing how much energy that requires, I can't, yeah, I don't know how you did that. How'd you do that? I don't know, man. But <laughs> I mean, I, I it's it's I, when I when I like to do something, I just do it. Like uh, it's hard to think <laughs> about. Sometimes I think a lot of times I think I'm the laziest person in the world because what? there's some types of come on most types of work I want to do. And I'm and I know and I try to do or try to even be in the mind space of someone that can do a certain this certain type of thing from the more you know every single day. It 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 does something. About, it makes me a little crazy, and I go, oh, that craziness. That's that's called laziness to everybody else that is like supporting their families. You dink. But um, when it comes to the thing that I like to do, then uh, that it's an endless, you know, an endless battery, almost. Hmm. But, or I'd like to, or my soul needs to think that and to keep going maybe. But the only reason I've been thinking about that at all lately is because I some I see it in my children now when they're trying to so hard to be good in some of them, 
you know, trying so hard to do good in school, especially under these conditions. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for them, even though it's, they want so much to have done the homework or whatever it is. And they're staring at the thing and just being like, I can't, I can't, like <laughs> put this down it's yeah, not working can't will it and that's exactly how i was yeah. and uh, but it turns out that you know maybe there are certain types of people for certain types of things mm -hmm. you know, to the best of their ability or whatnot yeah absolutely uh you told me recently that you were raised in a, or you were educated in a montessori environment is that do you think <laughs> that that like plays well, that in, was what i was that very plays into it now. oh okay uh, but, but like, I mean, do you think that that type of approach to education like plays into how your brain works now? You know? No, because my types no. of education were very, I mean, I was in Montessori for a very short time when I was very young. And the one thing I remember I learned the most out of it is that um, be careful leaving the door open when you have little kids around because some little kids, some little kids are the type of kids that would like to put their finger in weird crevices, just to be like <laughs> what's in there. And other kids are the type of kids that like, when they try to close a door or something like that, and it won't close, go, oh, that's yeah. weird, the door won't close. Close the door. And meanwhile, the one fingers. kid is super intent on trying to close this door and it won't close. And the other kid is super intent on not having his finger fucking chopped off. And he's screaming and they're both angry. And that taught me a lot about human communication to be honest mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah that's like a metaphor for yeah for, for just human communication in general so for about mm -hmm. 15 years now uh every door in my house has some kind of wedge so that can't possibly <laughs> happen to my kids <laughs> <laughs> i haven't um child proofed the doors like that in my house yet Maybe get I should on that. get on the stick, man. They only got ten of these. Yeah, it's true. You know, what you think is a lot when you're that age. But yeah, you've got five kids, man. That's that's got to be crazy in a COVID environment. It's crazy in any environment, yeah. but you know, like us, it's all perspective. I don't, you know, people have one kid that is, you know, a pure terror that <laughs> you know, can you know. Um, it all depends on the situation, I guess, and the and the people involved. Yeah. But I'm pretty fortunate that everybody in this house, this small house with seven people in it, um, gets along and loves each other, and and there's no horror going on, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's amazing to me. Like my yeah. folks were, it was yeah. The environments in which I grew up in were were, were very different. <laughs> yeah, me too, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like I'm still like unpacking the, you know, the fucked up shit that I am just now and real like realizing that I you know endured as a kid <laughs> and trying to make sure I don't like pass that shit along. Yeah. Um, to my daughter. It's a weird trick. Yeah. Uh, getting back to like the um, artist in residence thing that, that we were talking about, it might be fun to, to um, single out like a few projects, a few of your favorite records from that series. Sure. I could try to tell like a story about yeah. individual ones. So let's start with the first. Like, okay, the, you hit me with one and I'll try. Uh, Optagonally yours, man. O-Y-N-5. Do you want like, me to tell the whole history of what yeah. that is? Yeah, yeah, that's a okay. good story. So let's see. Okay, an Optigan is a what? Seventies toy uh, <laughs> machine organ. It's short for optical organ. It is an organ-sized toy from Mattel that runs on discs made out of film round yeah obviously round discs made out of film the way that you run film and there's one line of uh audio on the side of it um imagine something like that on the side of the strip except a bunch of circles of that going uh in, in the disc 
And so it's very flimsy and you shove one inside and every time you press uh, a note or what would you know, a chord organ activate chords or even some superfer superfluous buttons on the top, <clears throat> every time you press one of those, um, it activates a light, which activates a sound or, you know, a recording that was recorded on one of those lines. And it, depending on the disc, it could be anything from, you know, a church organ to birds chirping to church bells going off to, you know, and everything that would be a, normally a chord is usually an entire band doing mm -hmm. a riff in that chord. So there's, and, and the bands doing these things are really, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, P Hicks would be the one that obviously talked to most about this because he, you know, quite yeah. literally wrote the, everything about this eventually. Like when he discovered, when, it's funny, when he discovered this, he was like, check this out. And um, <clears throat> then he went off the deep end. He knows every single detail about all these things, about all the sessions. He's interviewed all the people involved. Wow. And, all the living people and, and it seems like living. such an extreme way. Like the, like they invented a new method of playing music that they then used just for a toy. Right. You know, the best. Yeah. It's crazy. At that time when, when like he brought one home, we lived, we were roommates and, uh, and he like brought one in and like, check this out. And at that time I was really into the idea of writing song cycles about things like right, trying to write song cycles from uh, uh, children's keyboards, you know, like taking every and like, oh, I want to write a song for each one of these things and then have like the, you know, the rap master song cycle or whatever. And <clears throat> I never got that far because then he recorded this thing in and it was like, oh, then now we're laughing and we're like instantly writing stuff like within an hour of having this thing. So, so like these pre-recorded elements of this, you know, this fucked up seventies toy were, were sort of the, the catalyst for you writing songs on top of them. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. During all that P Hicks, like I was saying, went to all these people and um, was given all of the master tapes from every session ever recorded for the Optigan including like most of which were never turned into discs. So. Right. <laughs> and these are like the high res audio. Oh, yeah. Like these are, like whereas, the perfect, these are the master right, tapes. Right. Whereas so, before you were having to work from the, the toy audio, right. you know. Which is cool in its own way. Right. Right. But that's, cool that's why like, the, the first two records are very lo-fi. And, uh -huh. and then this third record is quite literally called <laughs> OY and high fives. Yeah. And, and so P went through all those cutting up, like trying to cut stuff up like it would be on a disc. And then we would use it like it would be a disc. It wouldn't be like, oh, we have all this. So let's take this part of this, you know, this jam and this part of this, that, that jam. But we'd all just like use the same bits over and over like you would normally do it for from a disc and wrote an album of that stuff. And that is my favorite. That's my favorite record that I've ever done. <laughs> Still is. Yeah. I remember you telling me that when, uh, you know, back in 2017 or something, when you first sent it to me. <laughs> and I was like, it's like every, everyone says that about their new shit. But uh, yeah. No, no. Still your favorite? Yeah. Before that, it it's, was. It's fucking incredible. I listened to it last night. Um, not even knowing we were going to be talking today. It was just unprompted. <laughs> like just, uh, it's so, it's so good, man. It Thank you. like, what's your favorite track from it? I don't know. I like I, it. Cause it all depends on my mood and I, and I like it. And I'm not used to that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're still liking your own stuff. Yeah. I don't know. I, I like, hey, I could listen to that though. I wouldn't feel embarrassed if that was on in the room when I, when I showed up at the party. Good. Where if it was like when I walk into like a Denny's and Pinback is playing, I feel like an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hope in Your Eyes, that might be my favorite one. Okay, here, a short thing about Hope in Your Eyes. It used to be called Open Your Eyes. <laughs> okay. But I used so much compression 
that I, I like to purposely put too much compression on the way I sing so I can like a, mm -hmm. things and like that turns into, you know, its own percussion. You know, I like the percussiveness yeah. of what I can do with when I, when I know how to use compression, like, like some people we use, use distortion or, or feedback. And, uh, he was like, it sounds too much like you're saying hope in your eyes. Can you do it? And I was like, oh, I'll try to redo it. Like, open your eyes. Uh, but it was like, it lost a thing. I liked it. Huh. Yeah. So it's, just, oh, just call it hope in your eyes. Yeah. There you go. You changed it because of the recording uh, process. That's awesome. good story <laughs> well let's, let's move on to some other uh releases in this series the thingy record mm. uh, it, it seemed to connect with a lot of people I was really that's the one it. that we we uh, pretty often get um just random random motherfuckers on social media just being like when are you gonna repress the thingy album you know <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> um yeah. So, what what's the story behind behind the thingy record, which is titled what? Morbid Curiosity. Yeah. yeah. Well, when was the first note of Morbid Curiosity recorded? Oh, I don't know, but I can. Okay. What's Hit your best guess? Had started being a thing, 
And we was had it the 90s. Money. What was it? The 90s? I guess. Yeah. I don't know when was pin. I don't know when pinback started. Was that the 2000s? I remember going to Europe for the first time in 2000 something. I think I think you had some time. records in the late 90s. I, I have trouble with dates too. Um, <laughs> But uh, we had enough money that we had put together that we had bought a tape machine and uh, like Zach and I and <clears throat> we'd set it up at Paul, <laughs> Paul Mall's house, Paul, <laughs> Paul from Blackheart's house. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy that was working on a Blackheart records at the time helped us like put it all together. And the guy playing drums, Brent, like he couldn't even get off of work. Because we're all so poor. At this time, I never had any fucking money ever for anything up until somewhere in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about any money. <laughs> I yeah. couch surfed like most of my life up up till then, living off like, you know, there was a there was <laughs> there was a a coffee shop that would uh, sometimes leave their extra, you know, the uh, uh, baked items out after two in the morning. Yeah. And I would go down there and that I lived mostly off of that yeah, during dude. all the time that I was writing most of this shit. Wow. So, I, I, uh, just so you know, I'm with you. Like I, I, you know, lived off to, off of, uh, you know, dumpster diving when I was, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, 18 to 20 or something. Uh, and, but... and the, and even so these were much better times than I had had earlier. And I can't even get into that situation. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. So the drummer got like an hour off for lunch from his work, which was like and uh, drove to Paul's house. We played ran through all the songs once and he had to get back to work. <laughs> and, I, he, and meanwhile, like this stuff wasn't set up good. So there's like microphones falling all over the place. You can hear during so at least one song where like uh, one of the overheads just goes <laughs> like on stuff. But we don't have time to stop. Get the thing done. I, I bet so everybody, everybody until now has thought that that was an intentional creative decision. <laughs> Nobody probably even noticed. I, but, I uh, they do. There, there's like a hundred diehard fans that are going to watch this and comment on YouTube. This is someone you don't know. This is someone you don't know. Some place in the world you it's impressive that you're able to like um uh segment your brain in 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 such extreme ways you know where you're able to like make such meaningful music in 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 such a uh different variety of styles you know um you know we haven't even gotten to you know goblin cock or anal trump yet you know but it's like the fact that like that you're able to do octagonal yours, pin back, uh, thingy, and goblin cock and anal trump. It's pretty. It's pretty fucking unusual. Well, I think I think it's one of the things that makes you a, like really a, a unique artist is like you, you, just your ability to to you know write good music regardless of of genre and stuff like you're not um i don't know i hope it's good that's limited. all like i don't i, I don't man I don't know. it is all good man I, and i can tell you that like because like, oh, i try yeah. to do the same thing with a label 
where it's like, <laughs> you know, I try to not be like specific to genre, you know, it, if okay. someone would tell me that I'm trying to do too many things and none of them well, then I would completely okay. like go, yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, well, that take it from me, man. That's not the case. Um, Thank you. Like, you're doing all of them well, and that's what's fucked up. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and unusual, you know, and special about what you're doing. So, um we should definitely talk about anal Trump okay. if you're okay with it, but. All right. Uh, so, <clears throat> so, uh, all right. There's no good protest music anymore. <laughs> um, everybody has an agenda. Everything is fucked. I've been trying to, and everything that was happening with the Trump election, like immediately, like I got so depressed and so bummed out like thinking mostly like this the grabber by the pussy guy is going to be like the president to my daughters you know how do i explain that to them that yeah. this fucking guy is yep. you know at least in a lot most people's mind in charge of you in some way like it's it it's not doesn't put me in a happy place yeah but like what the fuck am i gonna do i'm not the kind of mind you know, to go into office and try to change things in that way. I wish I was or else I would. But, you know, I'm because, yeah. Um, yeah, I would be, it would be a complete fucking disaster because I'm so abstract on just reality as it is. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like just explaining, trying to explain to somebody what a boundary really is mm -hmm. and what money really is, you know never get anywhere um but anyway so it's very angry and being angry is not the best thing so to try to think of ways to turn anger into positivity yeah. is a what i'm assuming a healthy way to exist so like okay i could try to do a fun thing yeah and like this guy <laughs> his tweets to me were like at first i was like because i like to i even at that point, I would like do dumb tweet things where it'd be like, oh, if, uh, you know, if Seth Putnam w wrote this, these kinds of songs, it would be this. And if G.G. Allen wrote these kinds of songs, they would be called this and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, wait a second. Trump, his tweets are like <laughs> Seth Putnam fucking song titles anyway. Yeah. Seth Putnam was a guy that was in the grindcore band Andal Trump and... He's dead Anal, now. Anal cunt. <laughs> I'm sorry, Anal cunt. And uh, they were a great grindcore band. There does not, but it's one of those things for me, like G.G. Allen. I love G.G. Allen. There only needed to be one G.G. Allen, and then you don't need to do that again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah I'm not sure there needed to be about. one, to be honest, but. <laughs> I uh, do, because I think he took the thing of, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's so off topic <laughs> it's all um, right i all like right, right. Allen music but you know yeah. not so much for the babysitter <laughs> uh, right <clears throat> so yeah so so you basically like saw there was this like framework created right. by anal cunt that donald trump was already playing into in your right. mind and in my mind, like, that's how I do things. Uh, uh, it's like, I think of the thing, oh, I have to run downstairs and start writing it before it's gone. And, like, before I knew it, I wrote, you know, an EP's worth of material. Yeah. Like 10 songs or something. And I and, uh, was like, well, this would be fun. I could try to sing it, but my voice does not do this. And you can tell when somebody that doesn't do that kind of voice pretends to do that kind of voice. Mm. <clears throat> I... I hate that. I want it to be, I want this to be a real thing. Like, yeah. Um, I'm afraid of doing that in Goblin Cock a lot, but I think that I, for the most part, pull off what I intend my vocals to sound like with that band. Yeah. I do it the way I would do it. I don't pretend to do it like another guy. Right. Would do it. No, you sing in that band. It's not, right. it's not grand core. When know? it first Come started, on. there was a, there was a little bit of a line. I was uh, not very, <laughs> man, I needed to work on, but, but anyway, I, w I w um, just opens. I was going to go see Cattle Decap that night, 
and uh, say and I said hi to Travis. And I was like, oh, I got this thing that that'd be really funny if you sang on it can you do it tomorrow <laughs> either because yeah because the what do you call it the swearing them in or something like that was about to happen oh wow I get this all done and he came over like the next day he'd ever either just gotten off a tour or was about to go on a tour <laughs> and i don't remember who he was with he was somebody fun like mayhem or something weird i don't think it was Mayhem. no um Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, of course, because Travis and I were friends. We, and be, anyway, we hang out and, you know, we, d- we do like dumb DJ nights together. We do like karaoke things like that. <laughs> but um, well, had, had you ever collaborated uh, musically with him before? No, be, he I think we he'd mentioned it, but I'd be like, what would that be? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but this like perfect yeah. so he came by the next day we worked out those 10 songs or whatever had it out either that night or the next morning wow and like i, I like i was I, I tried to keep it a secret of who was doing it because like i said i don't the idea of people thinking that i'm spread out doing too many things and none of them very well uh i don't want i want people to you know, hear this thing as what it is. And that was yeah. what Gottman Cox started out to be. Like, mm-hmm. I wanted to take that residence thing of nobody knowing who I was and just doing right. this thing with pure intention and fun. Right. And to have. And, and you still do, like, you keep the the um, persona up when you do it live and stuff. Yeah. Which is nice, you know, like, that's, it's, it's cool. Like, being able to do this shit in character, e- even if people know at the end of the day that it's you. Like, Doing it in character, I think, um, is 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 fun for the audience, and I think it allows you also to have like more creative freedom in a in a weird way. You in know? a weird way. Also, the i the i I like the idea that with Goblin Clock, where we have two different characters, where us mm. we're, we're the characters of Goblin Clock, plus we're the characters of the guys that are us that have to fucking deal with goblin cock and right right yeah you're also <laughs> you're the the uh the guys who's like yeah so so for for people listening like gob the goblin cock guys like have two sets of characters when they play live where they have like uniforms with their names printed on them like that like they're union workers and shit or they're like setting up the gear and stuff and then those same people we test all the mics to go super yeah you them. test all the mics <laughs> And, the, and then and then you you go away as the as though you're the you know the crew has left you know and then the band comes back on with like you know black robes all the shit yeah. and uh, and then once the band leaves the crew comes back to like sell the merch and stuff and <laughs> yeah, uh, and to do an encore yeah <laughs> oh right Just do an encore <laughs> I forgot about that um, yeah it's it's. Uh, it's pretty fun. Um, I, I yeah, I, I, I've only seen Goblin Cock once live, and it was it, it was really it was really special, man. It sticks in my <laughs> sticks in my mind. Um, but so so this yeah that, back that back guy, to Donald Trump. Yeah, well, Goblin Cock was anonymous up until like right before the first record came out. I was so excited, like I'm going to do this thing, and nobody's going to know it's me. And then the guy putting out the record put my name on the cover. Ah, oh. <laughs> he, he didn't ask you. He didn't. He didn't clear the yeah. fucking uh, like promo sticker with you. I don't remember. He might have even done that. I don't want to be telling tales out of school, but I was, you know, on a oh, tour man. at the time and all this other shit. I, I can make excuses for something I don't even not even sure if I did or not. But either way, I, I can understand the desire <laughs> to do that as a label and wanting to, you know, sell records. But. uh so we did. We put out the anal Trump thing as a free thing on Bandcamp, and all of our things had been up until your record were either free or donation only, because like this is too fun, this is too good. I don't feel confident. I don't feel right in like trying to even the ghost of a thought of trying to make money off of this situation. Yeah, yeah. I just want to fucking <clears throat> take it out. And yeah, to, like, to, yeah, to be clear, like, yeah, we, we, there were some physical elements of it that cost money, but that was just to like cover the cost of those, you know, yeah. we did some five inch records, which is like CD sized 
records, <laughs> um, you know, and uh, all of these things were collected on this this one LP, which is called the first 100 songs, which is actually 100 songs. <laughs> and it all fits on side A of the LP. <laughs> like the whole thing is, the whole thing is 15 minutes long. Like that's, that's fucking crazy, man. Yeah, I like it. It's good. I like it. <laughs> I do too. I think, I, I just think it's, I got to do something I always wanted to do from the from when I was a, like a preteen, and I put the needle on the album of from enslavement to obliteration, and went like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> yeah, like is, like is the is the, is, is the right. speed wrong? What's going is something on? Something fucked up. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, someday I will do that. I don't want to sound too much like a chauvinist, but... When I come home and dinner's not ready, I go through the roof. Putting a wife to work is a very dangerous thing. Yeah, that record's so good, man. I I, I played um, one of the Anal Trump tracks on an earlier episode of this this radio show, and I think it was the one called uh, "Poor People Are Too Stupid to Get a Loan from Their Parents," uh, which is one of my favorite song titles. I think that record is is super impactful in in the in the trump era you know like i can't tell you how many times i played that for somebody and we just it, we were able to like sort of um grieve you know uh -huh. about about america you know what i mean like like it was a, a way to like laugh at and feel sad about the state of things you know it was, but it was healthy Good. I, I lately artistically, I've just want to fucking hit something with a hammer. <laughs> do you think anal Trump will continue to exist at all? Or do you hope that it goes away? Um, we were having this conversation as the, <laughs> as they were counting the votes, Travis and I, and, uh, we were just texting it and like, well, because there's one I'd real what I'd really like to do is one that could get me even in actual real trouble. I don't know if I should even bring it up. <laughs> bring it up. We can always cut it later. Okay. Um, <laughs> body camera malfunction. Ooh, I want <laughs> to to do that as the next thing of, of Travis and I like the same the same general deal but man that was that would have to deal with a lot of real people and real investigations and real life oh oh okay so wait you're saying like <clears throat> yes the like like when when there's like police brutality happening is, you know and and, well, and their is. and their body cameras don't you know magically don't work Mm -hmm. uh, like you're writing songs about that experience about actual specific <laughs> specific instances yeah and what happened yeah and <clears throat> oh man so at least that. somewhere they will always be on record dude in some way oh. you know? but a lot of people <laughs> i don't know i don't good, know man. Really like that idea but there are certain people that wouldn't like that idea who <laughs> 
Police? The kind of people that would know exactly where I live. Republicans? Fuck them. Uh. Uh, yeah, it's easier to be, you know, fuck all y'all when you don't have children. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I get that. <clears throat> I've had, like, man, I've, I have such mixed feelings about, like, um like protecting my family kind of ideas you know mm -hmm. um like Electrified, like my kid like my oldest son is he's got a girlfriend and stuff and i'm like don't make sure they don't find out about me like <laughs> the parent, like the parents <laughs> why because depend you never know who the parents are what kind of person they could be yeah <laughs> they look the kind of you know if it's the kind of person like 80 percent of parents like looking up a picture of me playing an octagonal of yours, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, no, you're not going, <laughs> you're never going over to that boy's house. And who could blame him, you know? Well, I could. I, I, could. I think that but would be... Uh, but we're the special ones, remember? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't believe that, but... <laughs> to me, it's uh, thinking of it as a parent, you know? Like when when my daughter Olive is you know whatever fifteen and she's you know dating some some boy or girl and like mm -hmm. it's like um they are and going I have to, and I have to look up person that person's on, parents it's like going to date the last person on earth you want them to date no matter what you do yeah uh, I, and, and as long as I guess that's that, yeah like I would be worried if that person person's parents were like a Republican you know well yeah like, but that's what's gonna happen <laughs> because they're human beings and and that's the way it is and well and that's, okay you know but, what that's fine and it's but there's a fine. thing okay so so when you live when you when you live a, a, a life of, of you know a pure life of being honest with yourself and everyone you love and everything and everyone around you, then <clears throat> that is only going to, you know, rub off in a positive yeah. way. You're sure, you know, teaching by example. And if, you, if you're, if like you put a person like that and with a person who's just a, you know, a denial laden fuck nose, you know, full of hate for people that for, for a reason they could never be able to articulate. Mm -hmm. Guess Who's going to rub off on who? Right. The exactly. Most, anyway. It's, that's, that's true. That's a very positive way to look at it. Because, um, I, you know, I was about to say, like, I wouldn't want my daughter, you know, uh, fucking around with, like, people, you know, <clears throat> who have these, like, bigoted ideas. But um, you're right that, like, who's going to rub off on who? Like, the... Because a person that lives that way is only making life harder on themselves. Yeah, you know? it's, and, and it's, it's, they go it's like, well, obviously the past. Yeah, and, and that kind of person is also inherently lazy. Yeah, in, in in those aspects of being alive. Right. So like, oh, I don't have this being hate. This hating everything is fucking exhausting. I know because I hate things and I don't want to hate them, and I'm just exhausted. Mostly, I hate myself, so that is beyond exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> well oh that's a loop you shouldn't you should <laughs> oh yeah see that doesn't make it better of course um, I should. that's why it sucks <laughs> but yeah like like one of the things i'm like most fearful about in, in, in regards to raising my daughter is like um you know kids always want to rebel you know against however they're brought up and no, they don't. You know, I, I well i i, 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 I did i don't think that's true i didn't no i like stuff they didn't like but it's not because i was trying to go like to trying to shock them it's just like it was embarrassing to be honest to, i like have I them think know that... about things i liked it was like yeah but i'm not doing this to shut oh you think you're shut no i'm not i just like the thing i'm sorry mm -hmm. i wish you know people pe people are gonna like like what they like because they like it I hope that's true. I, I, and I think the, I, I, with the the theory of rebellion. Guess who trots that out? The people being rebelled against. Yeah, dude. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a fucked up story. Um, so 
the house I was raised in, my parents never listened to music. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we just didn't even like have a, a stereo set up or anything, you know, like my parents, it just wasn't a part of their lives. And um, ha- however, like when, when I was like maybe, I don't know, nine, something like that, nine, 10, I um, discovered a turntable in the basement <laughs> and a handful of records, including, uh, including Michael Jackson thriller. And, uh, and I somehow figured out at that age, like how to hook up the turntable and play the record. And I would just sit down there listening to thriller in secret because this was also like around the time that Michael Jackson was first, you know, uh, accused of, uh, uh, child molestation. And, and, and I rem in my child's mind, like I remembered, my dad just saying sup- something about how Michael Jackson was bad or whatever, you know? And so, so it felt like this sin, you know, like I, I was like, I had to keep it secret, you know, that was one of my first like, like moments where I realized I love music was um, having to secretly listen to Michael Jackson's thriller in the basement. You know? <laughs> the way like kids in the sixties or, would listen to red fox records <laughs> yeah or people in the fucking soviet union would listen to like beatles records cut on the you know <laughs> Classic uh, it, like yeah like x-rays yeah have we just have we been through this as a method for putting out the remaining uh anal trump eps <laughs> no let's talk about it <laughs> we still got actually to- jonathan so i don't did you ever meet jonathan I'm sure I have. Jonathan Lee Horn, you know, do you know what I'm talking about? He's our coworker who, who died uh, earlier this year. Um, but actually just before this call, his mom stopped by the office and dropped off this disc of images of his x-rays of his lungs. Because huh. I was like, if you have any images of that, we might want to like make them into records <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so anyway maybe we can use one of john jonathan's lung images for the next anal trump well that would take care of where to send the donations yeah uh, that's a good one totally with the uh impetus of trying to do something positive out of a negative uh you also put out the the last thingy ep that uh, for um with the the donations going to elia's family after she yeah. had cancer a few weeks ago yeah so tell- thank you for that thank of course that. man no like um yeah so she uh what was her story she i mean she died of cancer recently too <clears throat> right right around christmas yeah I mean, it's a whole, you know, it's a whole thing um, in, in that, you know, there's a whole lot of loose ends in that relationship that will never, that are just like confusing and lost in space forever. So, yeah. <laughs> so what's a fun, positive thing now? <laughs> hey, what's, what's good times? What's good times? Um... I'm working on that plosive stuff with John Reese and Adam. Tell me about that. Yes. And Adam Willard. So, what uh, is this? Yeah. Hey, Rob Crow. Tell yeah. me about this new project you have going on. Uh, it's called Plosives. P L O V I S. I think. P L. Start again. It's called Plosives. P L O V. Nope. P L O S I V S. There we go. Hello, brains. Uh, <clears throat> and it's uh, uh, John Reese uh, from Rocket from the Crypt and Hot Snakes and Drive Like Jehu and whatnot. And I and Adam Willard from Rocket from the Crypt and uh, Against Me and Angels and Airwaves and 
social distortion, a bunch of other stuff. And yeah. uh, our friend Jordan playing the bass. And it's, you know, loud, fast, fun. Hopefully a record comes out very, very soon. It's being mastered right now. And the way things are, who knows when anything, it's too late to really announce anything. So, but that's what I'm stressing on right now, working on trying to master the first album of this. Yeah. Uh, but there's like three albums worth of material probably already. Right. And uh, yeah, we've been talking this week about trying to arrange the recording session for the next one, huh? So like the next or the yeah, hopefully the there's like <laughs> yeah, so there might be like three albums out. It's fun to work band. with people that work fast. Yeah, and that then I can an actual you know, like fun fast collaboration, and I'm really excited about it. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a really exciting new project, and like it's cool that you're able to work with guys that are able to work at your same pace. You know. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. Plus, guys have always wanted to work on it and just kind of figure, well, I'll never get to work with those guys. <laughs> uh, For one reason or Speaking of other guys you we have worked with, like, have you have you stayed in touch with Zach Hill? Because I like the, the, the fucking ago. the ladies record is so good, man. Thanks. Like, it's getting reissued, I guess. Oh yeah? Yeah. Who's doing it? Well, uh Tempres. Cool. And, oh, did they put it out originally? Yeah. Oh, I thought I thought it was. Never mind. I think it was the first thing I did for Tempres. Who put out the um, the first Goblin Cock record? Was that uh, Absolute Kosher? Kosher, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. I was getting them confused. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Temporary Resonance is is reissuing that. Mm-hmm. It's never been on vinyl either. Yeah, it has. Yeah. It has. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I only <laughs> own the CD. Uh, because that's the era in which I bought that album. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's fun to hear things on CD. It's yeah. I mean, <laughs> to rip off CD. I don't know. It's a really good record. Like that's, that's one that I fell in love with like long before I knew you as a person, you know? Oh, cool. um, thanks. I, it surprises me when anybody know it exists. Nah, it's so good, man. It's it's good to know that it's gonna get a get um, a reissue. Are you and Zach gonna record again? Do you think? As that, um, it was briefly touched upon, but I mean, Zach and I have made what four or five records together in different things. Weirdly, that what are those I on the record about? What? Yeah, what what has he been on? Um, I was on two of his Holy Smokes records. Okay. Like six songs, six to eight songs all together that were, were pure collaborations between the two of us on those two records. And and I and I I sang on the what is it? Team Sleep record. Like oh yeah. Of that. that wow. I haven't and thought I about that in a lead. long time. Let me briefly do a team sleep explanation. <laughs> please I, do i flew up to sacramento to work on a record with zach hella and pinback had toured together several times at this point and uh and i fucking love what i love that band and i love what they do and uh and zach is obviously the greatest drummer that has ever lived and we we're like okay let's write something so i took what was my studio at the time, these two Elisa speakers that I'm still using and this Elisa's uh, uh, like reference amplifier and my laptop and my shitty, you know, sound card at the time, which was, you know, sort of expensive at the time, I guess. And, uh, and, a, and a Rhodes mic and put them all in bags, sat them with me on a plane, <laughs> flew up to Sacramento for two weeks where I slept on his couch and the deal was during the day he was working on the hella uh church gone wild record that he was doing so he was at the studio all day he would come home uh in the afternoon we had like maybe two hours to write together until his uncle came home and we had to stop playing 
because <laughs> it's so cold work needed to rest and sleep or whatever. So I was there for two weeks with two hours of the day to get any work done, write wow. anything at all, because that is definitely a band that needs to collaborate to come up with songs as a pair as, instead of like, I got this part, you know, after like the first week, he brings this cassette over and say, Hey, my friends have this band. Uh, they, they, they need somebody to sing on these songs. Cause they need, they need to have their record done like in, in a week. And, and I'm like, Oh, and they're like, Hey, they'd be stoked if you sang something on this. So I go, oh, okay, whatever. And I got bored enough. So I was like, I don't care what this is. I'll just put it on and write stuff to it. And I'll, whatever this is, I'll just make my own thing to it and make it at least interesting for me as a, as a this is what I did when I had nothing to do in Sacramento. <clears throat> yeah. So I did tons, I wrote tons of vocal stuff for these six songs. And then then it's like oh then i gave it to zach and then they're like oh great they're coming over they're in they're this this like uh these this guy from what is i fucking forget what band he's in chino was in deftones deftones yeah yeah it's like is this deftones guy and like i don't know what that is it's like oh you'd like it it's like you know this kind of thing like oh i don't really like that <laughs> um but whatever uh, they came over, they listened to what I did, they really liked it, and then they went and took me to go to this Coliseum to, or something to see The Cure play. And it was, that, was, that was fun. I got to talk, hang out and talk to, to the other guys in the band in that way. And uh, they are all really nice. <laughs> then that record came, I don't I, so people like, I love what you do with that. My favorite Rob Crow band is Team Sleep. Which is a is a weird <laughs> sentence for me to hear well, from right. every word in it. Um, right, right. So I didn't have much to do with that. And then, uh, but you had no idea who was oh, in the band. Oh, that's the thing. But the, but the next, this. that's not that was just me demoing it. And then I got really drunk with them the night before, and woke up in the studio with a horrendous hangover. I was like, "Well, I'm here already. I might as well fucking do this." And then did all my vocals in one day. Wow. And. Uh, and who else is in that band? You got to remind me. I I can look it up if you. Yeah, you should. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone from fucking Faith No More, Mr. Bungo Phantomos, or what was Mike well, Patton? Probably... <laughs> Did Mike Patton <laughs> fucking? Uh, he sang record? on like they they have a whole album that they didn't put out, and he sang on one of those. Oh, okay. Uh. This is all worthless. Wikipedia is telling me that, that the Smashing in Pumpkins in Marilyn Manson. <laughs> it's a lot of people from a lot of music that I don't normally truck in. Yeah. But that's yeah, not yeah. to say it's bad and I'm good or anything. On the Wikipedia page, the concluding sentence is, following Team Sleep Sleep's first release, the band toured and began posting various demos on their MySpace page. See, I hate all of this information. <laughs> Can we not use any of this shit? This is. <laughs> oh, come on. That's so funny. What? It's such a, like a, a moment in time. And once again, everybody in that band was super nice to me. There are just some elements of what was going on that I can't have anything to do with. Yeah. I get it. You know, you've done a good job of uh, figuring out where that line is, you know? So that you can have a healthy, you know, body and a healthy family. Mm. It's good. No, I mean, like you're, uh, it's inspiring to see how you've um, been able to, to navigate that. Thank you. But my brains are fucking pudding right now. <laughs> Who knows? Hopefully I'm doing all right, but I don't know. Something weird about the pandemic, though, is that, like, it's kind I feel like it's kind of given everybody this reset, you know, where it's like you can change how you operate, you know, you even like uh, on the business level or whatever, like all these businesses had to make you like operate with their employees, you know, working from home and a lot of them are like, fuck yeah, this actually works out better, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and 
I don't know. There's so, there's something about about this like the entire world being disrupted in the same way. You know, like we're all we're all disrupted by by this one thing. And well, some of us more than others. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. For Anybody sure. who's going to have any sort of emotional growth or physical growth some in a lot of cases is going to change their lives. Yeah. But there's a whole lot of people like I can't remember in any doomsday, you know, book, any Hugo selection that where <laughs> when the when the bad thing, the apocalyptic thing happens, everybody like zombies, I'm going to just go run straight into them. <laughs> Look, there's zombies. <laughs> I dare to eat me. F- yeah. <laughs> You know. Yeah, I know, man. Part of me is like, uh, just let those people fucking kill themselves, you know. But but it's not them. It's the because they carry the thing that it's the it's the children yeah. of those people. You know. Oh. <laughs> and even yep. then, it's. I mean, I'm not a fan of the jingoistic aspect of any of that. I mean, it's easy to say, but if doing shit was easy, you know, these people would be right. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Uh, if doing shit was easy, Republicans would be right. I like the idea of cultures meshing and creating a new culture. Hell yeah. Me too. Um, That's what I try to do with I the think- label. <laughs> And I, I think anybody being ag- too aggressively protective of any culture is is dangerous. Yeah. And it's only when, you know, you leave your area of anything that you discover anything. And We're trapped in our own point of view, man. Like, that's just like what, you know biology dictates that's something that drives me nuts when people talk about the other side of things when there are every single you know individual is a side anything with with consciousness is a side hmm. uh, yeah dude how how fucking oh man when did this go weird? <laughs> <laughs> I love you, man. Love you too, dude. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. Um, have a good, you good too. rest of your workout. Love to the family. Talk to you later, man. Thanks for listening to the Joyful Noise Radio Hour.